In those verses, what does Jesus want? Point number one. Jesus wants his followers to be one. He wants his followers to be one. In his last prayer, before going to Gethsemane to agonize, Jesus prayed for his followers to be one. Of all the things that Jesus could have prayed about, he prayed about oneness among his people. It must have been really important to him. And I want to make three observations. First, in verse 20, Jesus says that he wasn't praying for his disciples alone, but for everyone who would believe in him through their word. In other words, Jesus prayed for us. Amen. Amen. Right here today. Jesus looked down through the, the millennia of time and he saw you and he saw me and he prayed for you and he prayed for me. That's an amazing thought that Jesus actually prayed for us before he died. And what did he pray for? He prayed we'd all be one. He prayed that we would be united. He prayed that we have harmony amongst ourselves. How would we achieve that success or that oneness? Notice in verse 21, the first part, he said that they may be one in us. You see, oneness begins in a relationship with God, in a relationship with Jesus. If we do not have an authentic relationship, with God, a daily relationship with Jesus, we'll never be able to have oneness amongst ourselves. Oneness begins in a relationship with Jesus, and it's not oneness of being one, only one person, because God is not one person, right? God is three persons. How is he one? He, it, it, it is a oneness of character and purpose. That is how God is one. He, his character, his character of love and mercy and kindness and gentleness and justice and truthfulness and, and, and his purpose, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, they all have the same mission. Now, they have different roles. They don't all do the same thing. They all have different roles, but they all have the same purpose. They're all working together towards the single one same thing. And Jesus wants us to be one in character and purpose. He wants us all to have a kind Christ-like character, and he wants us to work together for the same purpose. Amen. Look at verse 22, John 17, 22. Jesus says, And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one, just as we are one. Jesus says that the glory that God gave him, he gave us so that we could be one just like God is one. Now, now before I give you point number two, uh, we're going to get there through a pro an inductive process. I want to unpack that thought a little bit. First question, what is God's glory? The glory that he gave Jesus. Now, I, I was stumped about that for a little while. I mean, he doesn't say what the glory is in here. And so I'm thinking about, let's look at the context of Jesus' life. And as I thought about his life and his ministry, I realized what his glory was. I realized that his glory was his unselfish giving and love. And then I remember this statement in Desire of Ages that says, but turning from all lesser representations, we behold God in Jesus. Looking unto Jesus, we see that it is the glory of our God to what? Give. Through the beloved Son, the Father's life flows out to all, and through the Son it returns in praise and joyous service, a tide of love, and thus through Christ the circuit of beneficence is complete, representing the character of the great giver, Amen. the law of life. Amen. You see, Jesus' glory is unselfish giving. That's Jesus' glory. God's glory is really his unselfish giving character and that all he does is not for himself, but for his creation, whether it's us or whether it's angels or whether it's the unfallen beings on other worlds. Not only that, Jesus says he gave that glory, meaning that he gave that glory to us, meaning that Jesus wants us to be unselfish, give unselfishly too. 
He wants you and me to have the same unselfish giving spirit that God has. And that kind of a spirit is powerful. 